Well, <clears throat> some of the great medical minds of the uh, modern era have made it their ambition to make this world a better place to live. And one of the ways they're seeking to accomplish this goal is by eradicating one disease after another, completely getting rid of all worldly diseases. Physicians, doctors, scientists, naturalists, and others all look to rid this world of its most deadly viruses and diseases. It's certainly an honorable endeavor. I can appreciate it. I can appreciate the desire and the ambition to, to save lives and to preserve the sanctity of human life. But this past week, I came across another program it has a slightly different aim, a slightly different twist, approach to the eradication of human decline, decay, and death. I came across not just a program, but a competition between different medical professionals and companies that are searching for the code that would put an end to the human problem of aging. Yes, you heard me correctly. There's an actual competition between health professionals that are seeking to stop the aging process. Good luck, right? It's a competition that challenges teams from all over the world to quote-unquote hack the code that regulates our health and our lifespan. The name of this competition is called the Palo Alto Longevity Prize. And just to give you a better idea of what's uh, taking place here and what this is aimed at, let me just read their own description on their website. They kind of present it this way. The website for Palo Alto Longevity Prize says this. Let, let's hack the code. Just six decades after Orville and Wilbur Wright launched the aviation age, President Kennedy pronounced a moonshot. Fly people to the moon and back. Eight years later, the mission was accomplished. Now, six decades after James Watson and Francis Crick discovered the code of life, it is time to embark on another historic mission. Hack the code of life and cure aging. The Palo Alto Longevity Prize is a $1 million life science competition dedicated to ending aging. It's quite the undertaking, right? Project aimed at preventing people from, from getting old. It's the actual pursuit of that age-old fairy tale, the, the, the fountain of youth, looking for that. I mean, we have plenty of companies that spend endless amounts of money and resources to eradicate this disease or that disease, or they try to find this cure or that cure cure for thousands of different viruses so that the world can be a virus-less virus -less utopia, but very few have ever attempted to really eradicate death itself. I mean, that's essentially what they're trying to do. Eradicate death, stop the aging process so that a person doesn't ever die, at least not from old age. But as noble and humane as this competition might be, the truth of God still thwarts the plans of man. The promise of Genesis 2.17 still throws a wrench in this entire endeavor, this entire competition. God has said, you shall surely die. Every living person is still destined to die, Hebrews 9.27. Extend life, maybe, but to prevent death, impossible. It doesn't leave us with much hope in this world, does it? If only there was a way to guarantee the eradication of human decline and death. If there was only a way to stop uh, the aging process and prevent the downfall and destruction of man. And you might already know where I'm heading with this. But just in case that you don't, let me just tell you that the cure has already been delivered to us. The cure has already been found. I, I know you know the truth. I know you know there's a way. I know you're not ignorant of these things. You're Christians. You know there's a greater hope even in the midst of human decline and decay. But do you truly believe and realize that the hope you have as a Christian actually guarantees the eradication of these earthly troubles? We've come to this very last section of 1 Corinthians 15, this chapter that explicitly explains the resurrection of the dead, and this section deals directly with the eradication of human decline and death. It deals with the eradication of human decline and death. What man is attempting to do through the Palo Alto Longevity Prize, God has already promised to do and will do through Jesus Christ. If you want to crack the code of life and cure aging, then you don't need to look any further than what God has accomplished in, in the gospel, right? 
Man can continue to look for your cure. God has already supplied it. All the answers for eradicating sickness, disease, viruses, illnesses, pain, suffering, aging, and ultimately death will never be guaranteed by medical masterminds of our age. All those answers to those troubles are found solely in the gospel of God. The life, death, and resurrection. That's what we're talking about. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Him and in Him alone is the code of eternal life. Now, let's take a look at these last nine verses of 1 Corinthians 15. It's another section that should bring comfort to your soul. Hopefully this entire chapter has brought comfort to your soul. It should be an encouragement in the face of your mortality. It's more truth that God is using to say to you that, that there's nothing to fear. Don't fear anything, Christian. There's no need to, to dread human decline or human death. If you're a Christian and you have anxieties about the afterlife, well then take comfort, take refuge in these words. These words should renew re and refresh the weariest of souls. Find peace in these words. Find everlasting and life-giving hope in these words. It's a great conclusion to this chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, last nine verses, verses 50 through 58. Follow along as I, as I read it. Paul says this to the Corinthians. Now I say this, brethren. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on Im the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore... My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. In these verses, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, we're going to see how our future resurrection guarantees the eradication of two earthly troubles. We're going to see our, how our future resurrection assures, guarantees the eradication, the complete eradication of two earthly troubles that we're all too familiar with. Every single one of us is familiar with these things. Number one, our future resurrection guarantees the glorious eradication of our perishable body. In other words, this flesh and blood. Our future resurrection guarantees the glorious eradication of our perishable body, flesh and blood, verses 50 through 53. And then number two, our future resurrection guarantees the triumphant eradication of our perilous enemies, death and sin. Our future resurrection guarantees the triumphant eradication of our perilous enemies, death and sin, verses 54 through 58, really 54 through 57, and then 58 is the conclusion of this chapter. Now, we're only going to have time to cover the first four verses, 50 through 53, this morning. I know that there, there are some familiar truths in this section that we've already covered in weeks past and previous weeks, but I'm still taking two weeks to finish off this chapter. I'm taking two weeks on this last section so that we can gain the confidence we need when we are facing these earthly troubles. I want you to know, I'm not, I'm not plodding along in this section just to belabor some of the points that have already been made or just to be overly redundant with some of the same material. Instead, as we go through these closing propositions, these truths, I want you to grasp by faith the hope you have. I want you to stare, or at least be able to stare death in the face and not cower in fear. You know what I want? I want you to be able to arrive at the end of your life when you're gra uh, gasping for your last breath of air, struggling to go on, or maybe when cancer's eating away at your body, you're laying there on your deathbed, 
your organs are shutting down, I want you to be able to arrive at that moment in time with a peace that transcends those grim and gloomy circumstances because of the hope that you have in the resurrection of the dead. I want you to be able to do that and live that by faith. I want you to be able to say with Henry Francis Light, who was a Scottish Anglican, he was on his deathbed, he's dying of tuber tuberculosis, and he writes these words. I want you to be able to say this, this sweet hymn, this sweet song. It's a song, I don't even know if we've ever sung it here, if we even know, but it's a song that we should play and sing. But he, he wrote this, In the face of death, Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, O oh, abide with me. Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay and all around I see. O oh, thou who changest not, Abide with me. And then a few verses later, he writes this. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's veins shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. My prayer is that you would have the same hope as death draws near. And like Henry Light, you too would experience the same absence of all fear. Fear no foe, with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight, tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. The words of that song rooted in the truths of Scripture. They were a comfort to me when I watched my Christian uncle face death as he declined and died because of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, stripped him of his earthly life. There's a resurrection hope that should transcend all these earthly troubles, life's troubles, because it guarantees the eradication of our perishable bodies, flesh and blood. It guarantees the eradication of our enemies, death and sin. Let's look at verses 50 through 53 this morning. Our future resurrection guarantees the glorious eradication of our perishable body. Paul begins in verse 50 by saying, Now I say this, brethren. This is something that he's communicating to the entire church. Brethren is plural. He's saying, brothers and sisters, all of you need to be on the same page. Here's what you ought to know. That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Flesh and blood, perishable. Do you, do you know what Paul's referring to here? He's referring to the physical life that you currently have. He's referring to the physical life in this present world. And we know that because the phrase flesh and blood seems to always have a physical meaning in the New Testament. It's a common way to refer to, to life here and now. Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, just to give you a couple examples, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. He's talking about human opposition there. Human weakness, human frailty, man's physical frame or form. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Hebrews 2.14 says this, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same. Again, flesh and blood is the physical frame of man, the physicality of man, man's fragility or his, his fleeting physical existence. Jesus said to Peter, Matthew 16, 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Who revealed to Peter that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God? It wasn't flesh and blood. In other words, it wasn't finite mortal man. Contrary to flesh and blood, it was the self-existent ones. It was the Creator, the Maker, God the Father. So flesh and blood in 1 Corinthians 15 and 50 simply refers to the present physical life and condition of man in this world. And Paul says that that kind of flesh and blood 
in the second half of verse 50, is also perishable. It's perishable. In other words, it's a life that dissolves. It's a life that declines. It's a life that deteriorates. It's a corrupted life. It's a life that's headed toward ruin, destruction, destined for ruin. And Paul says that kind of life, that kind of life that you currently have, that kind of life that we're living right now, that kind of life cannot, it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It cannot inherit the imperishable. It's not a matter of possibility or, or chance. Our present physical life is absolutely incapable and not able to possess the life to come. If we were to show up on the doorstep of heaven, show up on the doorstep of God's kingdom with this body, we would be denied access to the kingdom. Just to give you a hy hypothetical example. We would be escorted away, unfit for the kingdom because we don't meet the criteria of what the kingdom requires. God would operate at that point, if we actually did show up on the doorstep of heaven, he would operate as this divine bouncer if we showed up at a fancy restaurant. You can't come into the pl this place clothed like that dressed like that and fleeting and failing flesh and blood. You can't enter into the kingdom clothed in perishable attire. You don't meet the dress code. You're not able. You're not given access. The way you're dressed needs to change, Christian. The body of this life is not inheriting the life to come. The kingdom of God requires you to have a new body. Even if which they can't, but just to go back to my illustration that I started with, even, even if, and again, another hypothetical, hypothetical example, even if the medical masterminds of our age could devise a way to cure the aging process, the body of this world is still not fit for the kingdom of God. Even if they could cease, stop, put an end to the, the aging process, the body of this world is still not fit for the kingdom to come. Even if man could crack the code of life, life is still vulnerable to death. Life is still susceptible to sin. It's still composed of flesh and blood. It still remains in a perishable condition. It can still die. Besides, erasing the aging process still wouldn't stop the Lord from destroying this world with fire when He brings in the new heavens and the new earth, is what we see in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13. And the new heavens and the new earth requires a different body, a new body. Flesh and blood, our current body, cannot inherit. It cannot adapt to the kingdom of God. It cannot inherit the imperishable. Why? Because our current bodies are perishable. They're corruptible. And the next world is an imperishable world that requires an imperishable body. I love this word inherit Paul uses. It's a word that refers to obtaining to something as a gift, uh, acquiring or receiving something as a, a secured possession, being an heir of something. That's what we do when we inherit something. Paul's saying you'll never obtain, you'll never receive that type of inheritance. You'll never be an heir of the kingdom in your present perishable condition. It just won't happen. You have no rights to the kingdom if you were to remain in your peasant condition. Your peasant condition. Your lowly, earthy, and poor physical state. Think about it. It only makes sense that, that a pauper or a peasant in any kingdom would not be allowed access to the palace or to the throne of the royal family, right? No peasant or pauper in any kingdom gets access to the royal family, to the throne, to the inheritance, to the palace. The peasant would need to be part of the royal family if he expects any part of the inheritance. And once he's part of the royal family, then he'll be appropriately dressed for the occasion, for the position. His heritage would give him access to the inheritance. And then he would be clothed in royalty. In the same way, our inauguration into the kingdom of God requires that we leave behind this peasant attire, this lowly attire, be dressed in an attire fit for the royal kingdom. And since we're part of the royal family, for those of us who are in Christ, since we're part of the royal family through Christ, there's no reason to believe that God would accept us into our current, in our current corruptible condition. Nor would he allow us to remain in our low, lowly earthy, earthy condition. You shouldn't want to take this body to the kingdom, right? 
I mean, I don't know if you're content with the way that you are right now, your physical frame, the things that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you shouldn't desire or want to take this current body in, into the kingdom. You should already know that there's too many problems with it. Already know of its weaknesses and shortcomings. Already know that this can't be as good as it gets. Surely not. At least not as a Christian. Something better is waiting for you. You should be excited about setting aside this body so that you can get the new and improved, the glorified body, which means you can get excited about dying. You can get excited about dying. I know that still might sound strange to think of it that way, but if you're setting aside this old corruptible body and you're getting something new and glorified, there's something there to where you can say, by faith, I'm, I'm going to get excited about my dying day. You shouldn't fear the day when you draw your last fleeting breath. This body, flesh and blood, our perishable condition, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why God says you need to undergo a change, a transformation. Your current body needs to be set aside so that you can take on a body fit for heaven. And that's what Paul communicates next. Look at verse 51. Verse 51, he says, Behold, you know, you know what he's communicating there? Paul is saying, listen, or, or listen up. Look, look here. Give me your undivided attention. Give me your complete focus if you fell asleep at the reading of this letter, 15 chapters in, you might have, some of you might have fallen asleep, but if, you, if you've fallen asleep at this point in time, then refocus, pay attention. If you've dozed off or started daydreaming, wake up, take notice of what I'm getting ready to say. Why does he want their undivided attention? He's getting ready to tell them a secret. Something that wasn't known in ages past. Something that wasn't revealed in ages past. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. This mystery, this, this event, this, this information that was once hidden from human understanding, a secret matter that only God had access to that God had true knowledge of, but is now being revealed to these Corinthian Christians and to every future generation of Christians that follow, the mystery is that both the living and the dead will undergo a necessary transformation so that they can obtain incorruptibility and immortality. That's the secret. That's the reality that was once hidden. A glorious transformation can be anticipated. There's nothing written in the Old Testament about the, about the uh, transformation taking place of the living and the dead. Paul, Paul alludes to two groups of believers who will partake in this glorious transformation. Those who will not sleep. Those who will not sleep. In other words, those who will not die. Sleep is this euphemism for death. He's saying there are those who will not die. There will be some who will not die that will experience this change. He's referring to those who will bypass death because of the rapture. Even the believers who are living, maybe believers who have absolutely nothing wrong with their current physical body, even those believers will undergo a change and a transformation. The body must go. The body must be put aside, put off. The soul must be undressed and then redressed with robes fit for royalty. They must get the royal robes of a glorified body. And then there's another group of, who experiences this change. Those who have died or those who are asleep. The, the, this group of believers will also experience a bodily change. Those who have gone into the grave, they too will get glorified bodies. They too will get robes fit for royalty. So whether you're a believer who's alive or a believer who has died, when God is ready to clothe you with your new body, then you'll get exactly what you need so that you're fit for the kingdom of heaven. Christ could come right now. And we would all get a glorified body, a new body. Your body, it's not good enough for, 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 for heaven, for the kingdom of God. Now, no, notice two other things. Two other things. Look at how fast this change will take place and when this change will pl take place. 
He says, we will all be changed. And then in verse 52, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast our change is going to occur. And then he says, at the last trumpet, that's when this change will actually occur. For the last trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. First, how fast we're changed. Paul says, in a moment. In a moment. The word in a moment is atomos in the Greek. Atomos in the Greek. Literally, it means indivisible. It's where we get our word uh, atom from. Atom. It refers to a small unit, the smallest possible unit that cannot be cut. And by Paul using this word, he means that our transformation will come about in the smallest unit of time. Our transformation is going to be that quick in the smallest unit of time. It will hit you so fast, you won't even know that it hit you. Like a bomb dropped on a sleeping city that hasn't even been forewarned of this impending danger that's getting ready to, to land on them. This isn't a slow change. This isn't like metamorphosis, metamorphosis uh, setting in where something changes from one stage to the next and it takes days or weeks or years or whatever, whatever it might be to obtain its final state. This is instantaneous. This is immediate. Your body goes from garbage to glory in the smallest possible unit of time. Paul emphasizes the same point with a different analogy. He says we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Literally, the twitch of an eye or a rapid eye movement. We could even say that the, the amount of time it takes you to blink is the amount of time it will take the Lord to change and transform you. The Lord has no interest in dragging out this process. I want you to think about this for a second, just kind of setting aside what we're currently talking about, just as a way of implication. I want you to think about and marvel at the awesomeness of God. Marvel at the greatness of God. Marvel at the might and power of God. Just to think through what this text is communicating. Not only will God change your living or dead body, depending on what state you're in when, when this change occurs, but not only will God change your perishable body in an instant, he will also change every other believer from every other generation at the same point in time. In the twinkling of, of an eye, in, in a moment, in a split second. I mean, do you want to talk about might and power? Do you want to talk about ability and capabilities? Think about how long it takes you uh, to change your image in the morning when you wake up and arise. For some of you ladies, maybe even some of you men, it might take a complete hour to get ready in the morning, to change your image in the morning. Others, it might take 20 or 30 minutes. My point is that it takes you time to change your image. And you're only changing your lowly condition into a more presentable, more presentable lowly condition. But think about what God will do. Think about his might and power. He will change every believer, millions, maybe even billions, who knows how many, but every single believer, and he won't just give them a presentable makeover. He will utterly transform all of us into a perfected state, and he will do it before you can finish one single blink of your eye. How awesome is our God. It makes you just want to stand back and worship our creator and maker just for his might and power, his capabilities. I don't know about you, but that just makes me marvel at, what, at who he is beyond our, compre beyond our comprehension. I mean, it just uproots the, the ways that I put God in, my, in this tiny little box sometimes that I place him in. He is majestic in holiness, mighty in power, we should have no doubts that He is fully capable, fully able of changing and transforming us into the likeness of His Son at the snap of a finger, at the twitch of an eye, in a moment, the smallest possible unit of time. And then Paul sweetens the deal. He sweetens these truths and tells us exactly when we can expect this change to occur. He says, we will all be changed, verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And then he says, at the last trumpet, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be, be changed. At the last trumpet, Paul 
could be alluding to, probably is alluding to, Old Testament passages that speak of the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. And in certain Old Testament passages, it was prophesied that a trumpet would be used to pronounce the arrival of this particular day, the arrival of Christ. For example, Isaiah 27, 13. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet will be blown. And those who are perishing in the land of Assyria and, and who are scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. That takes place at the great trumpet. Or Joel 2.1, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Future, this is looking forward. A sound and alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Again, it's going to be pronounced with the trumpet. Zephaniah 1, 14 through 16. Near is the great day of the Lord. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet. And a battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corners of towers. It's a day of judgment for those who are not in Christ. It's a day of celebration for those of us who are in Christ, rejoicing in what he's going to do in the twinkling of an eye for us. And then we even see this event of the last trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, a New Testament passage. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The trumpet's a way of announcing end time events. Uh, Christ's coming will occur in an instant. The end being heralded by the trumpet call. And it's this trumpet that announces this moment of change for us. The trumpet pronounces a joyous time of festivity, a time of triumph. Both of those uh, uh, themes are in place here in this passage. This last trumpet will sound... Jesus Christ will triumphantly be seen as the last standing victor. The enemies of God will be fully and finally subdued. Everlasting praise will break forth to God and you will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ will rise. All of these events will take place when the last trumpet sounds. But the focus of the passage is that the dead will rise. Anthony Thistleton has said this, the dead will be raised without degenerating decay and we shall be transfigured into another form. John MacArthur in his commentary on this passage gave a vivid illustration of this reality. He said there was a time uh, during the Civil War where, when a group of soldiers had to spend a winter night without tents out in an open field. And during the night... Uh, a heavy snowfall had fallen several inches. At the dawn of the next day, the army's chaplain reported a strange sight as he looked out over this field. There's snow caps everywhere, white everywhere. He said the snow had covered the soldiers who were out there laying asleep in the field. The snow had covered the soldiers so that they looked like mounds of new graves. And then the bugle sounded. And the bugle sounded to awaken the military personnel. Each man immediately arose from each mound of snow, rising up as it were to be grave-like. He said this army chaplain pictured of what was taking place here in 1 Corinthians 15. Can you imagine how cool of a sight that would be if you had this passage in mind when you're sitting there, this vivid illustration, this vivid picture of what the dead in Christ will be like when they rise at the last trumpet, when the trumpet sounds? There will be an immediate resurrection for every believer and they will be dressed with a body for eternity. Out from their earthly graves, they will arise. There won't be a delay. Some won't stay asleep. Others won't rise. Everyone at the same time. There's not going to be a snooze button to hit when the alarm sounds at the resurrection. All will hear the sound. All will rise. The graves of every believer will be emptied. Everlasting physical life will leap forth from the grave to take on their perfected state. Body and soul reunited once again in a perfected state. And it happens with the, within the shortest amount of time possible. Blink of an eye. Sound of a uh, twinkling, uh, a blink of an eye. 
at the sound of a trumpet blast, change, transformation, all that will take place. Not a single one of God's people will be neglected. No one's left out of that equation if you're in Christ this morning. Beloved, do you realize that the last trumpet could sound at any moment? Do, do you realize that it could, it could take place at any moment, which means that our king would come at any moment, that he would come quickly, he could come before I finish the next few thoughts of, this, uh, of what I'm saying. I, he could come before I finish this sermon. He, he could come before you fall asleep tonight. He could come before you awake in the morning for work. He could come in your next waking hours. He could come before your next anticipated vacation. He could come before your next promotion. He could come before you age one more year, before you actually hit retirement. He could come before you reach your next milestone of life or before, you, before your, your very own death. And when he comes, and the last trumpet blows, our poor, lowly, perishable condition will be instantly changed into a glorious, imperishable condition. I don't know about you, but there's something here, obviously driven and motivated by what the Spirit is doing in my heart, but I don't know about you, there's something in me that says, come. There's something in me that says, come now. I'm okay with setting aside this world, putting it off, being done with it. Don't let another word proceed from my mouth during this sermon. Interrupt this sermon. Dress me for heaven. I'm ready. Roll up this world like a scroll. Let it creation as we know it be consumed and destroyed. Lord, finish what you've started. Bring to fruition this glorious hope of a resurrected life. Do you anticipate the coming of Christ that way? Do you desire it? Do you long for it? Do you want to see Him? As believers, we're told to welcome this day. We're, we should be anticipating this day. Paul wrote this perspective to Titus. He said, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's the first advent of Christ, instructing us to deny God ungodliness, worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And then he says this, looking, we should be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. That's his second advent, his return. We're to live as those who long for and love his second coming. 2 Timothy 4.8. Do you live with an eager expectation for the coming of your Lord? Do you want to hear the last trumpet sound? And based off of what we're studying in this context, there's nothing wrong with anticipating this coming because of what he'll be bringing with him. He's bringing the delivery of a new and transformed body for you. You know, we all know what it feels like to receive something new. Sometimes we receive something new and it's life-altering. Sometimes we receive something new, it's life-changing. And for example, I'm going to use a trivial example here, but bear with me. But for example, if you're accustomed to, let's just say, watching TV, and you're used to watching TV on your old, outdated television set that can only project images in low resolu resolution graphics, the size of your TV is maybe about 19 inches, we're very small, Think about how TV watching would change for you if you actually went on Amazon or some type of website, you went on Amazon, purchased the best TV that was being sold on the market, a, a 75 inch ultra high definition 4K TV, whatever's out there, the best, the best there is. Every upgrade, every bell and whistle, you, you add it to your cart, and in a moment you realize that your TV watching dreams are coming true when you finally hit the buy button. Putting aside this 19-inch TV, upgrading to a 75-inch glorious machine. If you know that you're going from garbage to glory, it's going to radically change the way that you think. It's going to radically change the way that you experience TV watching. And can you imagine the day when your 75-inch ultra high-definition TV, 4K TV, is being delivered? You see the UPS man driving down your street, getting closer and closer. Stops at your front door, your heart's racing, excitement's in running through your veins, shooting through your veins. The driver unloads this massive box, he walks it up to your doorstep. Purchase like that, it's life-changing for how you experience TV watching. Again, I know it's a trivial illustration, but it helps to make my point. If you're going from garbage to glory with something so superficial like a new TV, and you're excited about something so vain, how much more should there be an excitement ripping through your veins 
for the day when this garbage body is transformed into a glorious body at the coming of Christ. How much more excited should you be for that? We get excited about the mundane, the vain, the superficial, the shallow. We get excited about things here and now. We don't get excited about this. How can we not be excited about this? When you give careful thought and meditation to the coming of Christ, does your heart get excited at all? Are you so wrapped up in this world that there's no excitement? Is your heart less excited at the coming of Christ because it's an interruption to your life and what you want to accomplish and do in this life? Minutely interested in the delivery of your new body. Can you look with eyes of faith through the streets of this world and anticipate the arrival of Jesus Christ because you just can't wait until He steps out of heaven once again to make all things new, deliver to you this ultra high definition 4K glorified body, whatever that might look like. Does that excite your heart? His coming should radically change the way you think because it will radically change how you will live life in the new heavens, in the new earth, for all eternity. It's something to get excited about. And then Paul comes to verse 53. He tells us the reason why we will be changed. He tells us the reason why we'll be changed. And we'll close here. He says at the end of verse 52, we will be changed. Take it to the bank. It's going to happen. It will occur. Why? Why will we be changed? Well, the answer is in verse 53. For or because, that's the way it's set up grammatically in the text, for or because this perishable perishable must, it must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must, it must put on immortality. There's no other option for the believer. No other option. You couldn't keep this body even if you wanted it. God's getting rid of it. Why? Because God needs to give you different attire for the kingdom of heaven. He needs to give you different attire for the kingdom of heaven. The perishable must put on, he says, the imperishable. The mortal must put on immortality. The verb put on, Paul uses it twice here in verse 53, but the verb put on literally means to dress, to clothe, to dress or to clothe. God will be giving you a new wardrobe for his kingdom. He's taking what is corruptible and he's making it incorruptible. He's taking what's subject to death and making it into an indestructible life. Once again, the, these are the spiritual realities that should stimulate your heart, electrify your heart, cause your heart to swell. Our future resurrection guarantees the glorious eradication of our perishable body. And then next week, we're going to come back and we're going to see how our future resurrection guarantees the eradication of our perilous enemies. Sweet text next week. Death and sin are eradicated forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, this, this chapter is such a riveting account of what we can expect. I know Paul's talking to the Corinthians. They had their doubts about a bodily resurrection. This is such an encouragement for us who don't doubt a bodily resurrection, who are just looking at life and then maybe staring at death and wondering what happens. Well, we know what happens. You've given us the answers. And I just pray that in the midst of trial, hardship, decline, decay, deterioration, even death, um, we would say, where's your sting, death? Where's your victory? Thanks be to God that it's all been conquered by our triumphant King, Jesus Christ. Pray that we would find our hope in Him. In His name we pray. Amen.